fear that we fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. They will run to the house, let them have very good hot flesh. Now I show me for it. Now for them, they are pent up feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. There are a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Varm Blog Solo. And today we're doing more real talk about unions. I will also be going on uh, TIR, which I believe will have aired by the time this is released, although I'm turning this around pretty quickly to keep the stats up to date. And unfortunately, like with my series on alienation, the stats I have are not super great. Now, since my last video, we've had the AFL-CIO make statements about the 273,000 or 1.5%, I mean, or 1.9% increase in raw union membership in 20, uh, from 2021 to 2022. Um, they're... They're pointing out that union density only declined because there were 5.3 million people um, re-entering the workforce last year. And I will show you the Bureau of Labor Statistics report so you can see that for yourself. Now, I already covered this in my last video and how the media was often way too optimistic or maybe even misleading on this. And I mentioned uh, some of the problems with union leadership funding and why the unions may not be as responsive as one hoped, as mentioned in a Jacobin article that is linked in the show notes of the prior show. I'm not using that work today. Today, I'm mostly relying on the work of Doug Henwood, um, whatever faults I may have with him, and there are many uh, that I've had with him politically, his statistic work is generally pretty good. And, uh, and Doug Henwood has actually gone through and compiled a, a graph from multiple sources so we can get the data on the long-term trajectory of unionization. Ironically, the Bureau of Labor Statistics only started keeping data on unions in the early 1980s. There also isn't a whole lot of data on public sector unions, because there weren't that many, until the mid, uh, the early 1970s, maybe late 1960s. And um, Henwood's been good enough to compile that. I'm going to try to get in closer so you can see what we're talking about. You can see here on this graph that the high point of unionization um, was mostly in the private sector, and it was in the early 50s. 1951 is the peak. Public sector unionization really starts to take off during the 1970s, and there's a series of wildcat strikes that corresponded with that. Some of the most famous were in the post office and the postal service. So while the AFL-CIO statement about net, about gross increase of union members, the union density problem is big. And when you actually look and disaggregate the stats even more than the Bureau of Labor Statistics has, it gets even more worrying. And Henwood has done that for us. 
And again, I'm going to link all this in your show notes for you. Private sector union density in the United States has never been more than about 35%, 34.7 to be precise. Public sector unions had a good run from 1973 to 1994 when they peaked at 38.7%. And the largest public sector unions are, quote, protective services are police. And the next largest are teachers and nurses. So unionization varies widely by state. And we can see this here. I live in a state in Utah that has very low unionization density even though we have a fairly strong teachers union and a police union, uh, we have a union density of less than 4.9%. Same true as Idaho, same is true uh, in most of the South and the Tidewater South and and Florida. Interestingly, uh, unionization in Alabama is actually quite high. Union density is high on the coastal west and very high in New England and parts of the Rust Belt. But we can see this was once all strong union areas and we can see declines in unionization with the decline in manufacturing in a lot of the Rust Belt. So we can see declines in Michigan, um, Ohio, etc. So where have we seen increase in union density? Well, we've really only seen it in Vermont, Kansas, and in New Mexico. And we've seen massive declines in union density in West Virginia, Illinois, Washington, D.C., Nevada, Alaska, Iowa, Michigan, Indiana, and Wisconsin. And if you're looking at these and going, oh, these are the rust out the Rust Belt states have become contentious in elections. I wonder why. And here we are. But that just tells us the the amount by density. And if we look at the age range in a lot of these states, a lot of the younger areas of the country, the Mountain West, the South, to some degree the West Coast, only the West Coast is a strongly unionized area where there's a where that is that has a lot of young people in it. But it gets even more concerning. The headline figures on private sector union density, says Henwood, obscure an important fact. The downward trend is largely a story of declining manufacturing. Over four-fifths, 88% to be precise, of the fall in the number of unionized workers since 1983 is accounted for by the loss of union jobs in manufacturing. Since 2000, it's 84%, and it's a clear history. And we're going to get to why why some other union sectors that people are very excited about are are not going to be as efficient to organize or to draw contracts from as this was. These were high shop density places. So for one contract, you may have several thousand workers covered per job site. That's how factories work. So as factories have been either offshored or more often actually automated and the and the density of manufacturing has declined the decline of unions has gone precipitously with it particularly after the 1980s now we know why this is bad and unions uh people understand that unionized fields have better wages, et cetera. I mean, that's pretty well known and accepted now, unlike in the 1990s, which was a low point of union popularity. 
And we've seen in the increased unionization of women, but largely through the care circles, uh, so nursing and teachers. Non-manufacturing is overwhelmingly services. Now, this uh, does include mining and construction, but don't get your hopes up. While mining and construction are are unionized, mining much more unionized, I believe, than construction, mining is not a huge part of the, of the labor sector and hasn't been for a long time. In 1983, it was only 1.5% of the unions and in, in, um, in 2001, it was 0.5% of all, not 1.5% of the unions. In 1983, it's 1% of all laborers, and now it's 0.5% of all laborers. So it's pretty precipitous decline there. Construction has been holding steady at 6% of private employment, but includes a lot of contracting work and a lot of non union work. And the areas that have been growing for unionization is even more worrying. The biggest, you know, we, we've seen the biggest growth in the largest unions are grad student workers at major universities. But grad student workers at major universities are necessarily transient. The most they're going to po- uh, occupy a position is in six years, which creates a structural problem for union membership. That structural problem is pretty clear because uh, no grad students there to really build cadres and organizing skills is going to stay long enough in the position to really build a long-term union base. You're going to constantly have to rely on non-worker members to maintain union staffing. And it rank and file is going to be weaker in transitory unions like that. So while we see higher ed uh, asserting itself and the largest union filings in America were, in 2005 were all grad student unions, we, we've noticed that the majority of small filings have been in the service sector, uh, particularly food. Now, the Bureau of Labor Statistics notes that only about two, let me see if I can find the stat here, but only about 2% of food service is unionized. But with things like the Chipotle union and the Starbucks union growing, we can see that that's a major sector. And that's where a lot of these, the 620 something union filings came from. About a third of them was just Starbucks alone. Um, I talked about that in in my last video as well. But those Starbucks uh, and Chipotle are for job sites that often only have 20 to 40 people on a team. So union density will be low. Sorry, I need to change that. Don't think fun fact. Stat there real fast. There's also some real worrying trends we need to deal with. And I'm going to share the work here of uh, Nolan Hamilton, uh, uh, who does the labor beat for In These Times. He does good work. He went through this report. It's a 27 page report by Radis Research called Labor's Fortress of Finance. But it talks about why labor unions basically aren't worried about money and thus not worried about growth. If we look at this here, and let's see if I can make it bigger for you. We can see that revenues as in dues have gone up 28.4%. Now, revenues going up have not been from union growth, which means dues are getting more expensive. But net assets have increased 91.1% since 2010. This means that union leadership is heavily invested from what it looks like mostly in land and stocks, things that are not particularly liquid. Union spending, however, has not kept up with surplus revenues or with net assets at all. Union spending has gone up since 2010, 16.5%. Notice that revenues are up 
12 more percent than that. And we're not even factoring in how much more net assets went up. Now, assets may have depre depreciated in, in the future. We might see that. Um, although Radish Finance says that this could double by 2030 if current trends maintain. However, let's be honest, people projecting current trends into the future uh, when they talk about land values and stuff <laughs> are basically doing Statist uh, are basically doing statistical magic. So, the average annual wage has increased from fifty-three to seventy-two thousand dollars a year nationwide by twenty twenty, but we can see that. That's kind of been eaten up by inflation. During this time period, we have a paradox. Labor membership is dropping precipitously, but labor leaders have no incentive to engage aggressively and spend the money that they've been increasing in revenues. It looks like a perverse incentive market where the net assets are being held to increase the labor union's values and ability to maybe command lobbying power. But net uh, membership can be allowed to decline. Now, uh, this is a paradox, a paradox that actually I think um, interest, interestingly is why labor has not been as aggressive with the Democrats as maybe it should have been. Nonetheless, we can see that there's a strategy and theory problem here. Union membership can decline and union revenues can grow. Now, Bill Bradley in the 1980s, before this was even as severe as it is now, pointed out that this was part of why unions were becoming unpopular in the 1980s and 90s. Bill Bradley is not a leftist. I talked with Michael Brooks about this back in the day, and we both concluded that, yeah, the third way Democrats actually were looking at facts on the ground. Now, if they were if unions were concerned about union member growth and not assets, it would make sense that they would spend some of this, some of these net assets to grow. In fact, uh, Radish Research actually has some suggestions for them. And I, I strongly suggest you go through this document. There's not an economic, there's not a strong economic incentive for organized labor or highly compensated labor leadership to, to economically align with status quo to upset an unvirtuous economic dynamic. As was the case in 2010, the labor seemed poised to obtain generational changes in labor laws only to be thwarted by moderate bureaucrats in the filibuster. The PRO Act and its public sector companion bills appear to be headed for defeat by similar forces, and they've been defeated by this point as we've moved to a Republican Congress. Um, as Hamilton says in his predictions for labor in 2013, um, Labor's legislative gains have grind to a halt. Two years of Democratic control of the White House and both branches of, of Congress, con uh, organized labor got money for its pensions and a good but severely underfunded uh, Nas National Labor Relations Board and some minor regulatory changes, but it got a crushed railway strike, no PRO Act, and that's going to be as good as it gets. We're likely to see labor activity, not just in the normal places, nursing, actually we're down in labor activity in education, uh, et cetera. But we also might see it in sports and in some mining sectors. But we are still not even back to the labor strike activities of the early aught teens, as I pointed out last week. 
Another realistic thing to look at is that most of the new unions from Amazon to Starbucks haven't even done contract negotiations yet. And a lot of these contract negotiations have so far contained things like no strike clauses. If you can't strike, you don't really have your union be anything but a lobbying arm and a lobbying arm with only shops with 20 to 40 people in it is not particularly effective at all. Furthermore, if we combine the fact that union growth is happening in the in the temporary academic market and in the highly under-unionized restaurant service sector, it's only 2% of unions, like I said, we're also going to notice that uh, these jobs are almost all transitory. So long-term organizing skills, long-term contract gains are not going to be incentivized in the same way because the workers are going to move on. See, a lot of what you haven't been thinking about when you're told to think about labor by leftists and liberal media figures is where the labor organizing is at. It is great that there is labor organizing in transitory fields. T uh, TAs, adjuncts, restaurant workers need representation and they need the ability to fight in a very, very uh, underrepresented market. That's a good thing. That's why people are fighting it. But their ability to build long-term labor skills and have massive contracts and even be able to really effectively threaten ownership with strikes, given the diffuse and broken nature of even corporate-owned sites, and we haven't even gotten to the franchise problem, and the fact that many of these contracts being negotiated so far have had no strike clauses in them, this is not looking as bright as it seems. Like I said last time, people love the idea of unions, but neither leadership nor the general public really see the incentive to enter them in their fields where they are longstanding. While there's lots of labor activity out and about right now, and this would be a strong time to do it, given inelasticity in the market, even with tech layoffs beginning to really heat up. We don't see a lot of evidence that anything is going that way. And when it does, it is not organized by any groups that can represent it. As I talked to Anton Yeager in a show that I will release sometime in the next month, it seems like there is an oligarchical incentive to to flirt with mass politics, but it immediately break it up and push it out because it threatens its own donor and or economic base with unions, their investments, with politicians, their ability to collect donations. When their donor base is at direct odds with their mass base. This is also true for the GOP, but the GOP seems to have let the genie out of the bottle. But this is not just a U.S. problem. Sturmer's Labor Party seems very clearly to be okay with suppressing the mass base of the Corbyns that grew particularly in London if it secures its funding in British society. Even if it means it takes a longer time to defeat the Tories and we they seem to be unable to do anything despite successive waves of Tory failure in government. Now, as Anton Yeager says, this also hurts the right's political motivations. Mass parties have actually seen a decline in mass participation, and parties that were generally mass participation-based have resembled American nominal affiliate, a partisan affiliation. For Americans, you know, if you join a party here, you're basically, whether it's the Green Party, you know, or a lot of other parties, unless it's a, a party that requires a lot of you, you're just changing your nominal membership on a card and what primary you can vote on, not really fundamentally changing any commitments and making any social allegiances with it beyond something nominal. It doesn't require much of you. It's a low-cost decoration, which is why 
we've seen a decrease in membership and say partisan affiliated civic groups and small and local groups while we have seen an increasing partisanization of the general public. It's just lower cost to declare partisanship. Similar with labor. All of us know we would be better off with a strong union movement, but the incentives aren't there for either side. If unions have no incentive to strike, workers have and workers have no incentive to pay for the contract negotiations, i.e. that they're not closed shop. But if you do close the shop, labor leavers have even less responsibility to be responsive to membership because they're guaranteed a certain amount of income, uh, of revenues. That, well, we can see how this goes. Furthermore, we have to look at how much of unions are increasingly professionalized and this professional union's dependence on revenues from investments, which means that labor union leadership is structurally invested as a capitalist. It's time to get real. I'd like to thank our patrons, uh, particularly my Khan and Kahanans, uh, my most recent Khan and Kahanans, Joseph M., Jonah H., Philip R., and James F., thank you so much. If you'd like to be a Khan and Kahanan, you can sign up at the Patreon link in the show. It supports me and continues me doing this as my second job. Um, it also pays for a lot of the research that I do. I'd like to thank... Uh, Doug Hinwood, it's hard for me to say given how much crap I've given him in the past, and uh, Hamilton Nolan, I think I flipped his name earlier as Nolan Hamilton, for the work they've done this year, and I will list the four articles in the show notes today. Um, I'd also check out labor notes for some positive labor news, but we need to be realistic about where we're at, and it doesn't look good. Um particularly because some of the public sector unions are going to have a lot of retirements soon. Uh, the teaching staff is, is getting strategically very old. In fact, a lot of places are looking at staffs that are very young and then paired with people who are in their 50s and 60s. So we're going to see how a lot of that goes. And with that, good day. لكم تبدو اثاره الانفجار الثاني هو انفجارات كبيره وهائله ربما هذا ما اشار له المسؤولون العسكريون We fear this. We fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't.